Okay, so um, hello everyone, welcome back to the conference um, for this session. session. Um, so this session is the Data Producer Talks, and we have two talks um, from the ONS. The first is an update on the Labour Force and Annual Population Surveys, and then there's the transformation of labour market statistics. So let me just read out about Martina and Petia, our speakers. So Martina Helm works in the Social Survey Directorate at the ONS as a survey manager for the LFS and APS. And Petia Kozhuahorova is the methodological lead overseeing the weighting and estimation for the LFS and APS. Okay, over to you then, Martina and Petia. Thank you very much, Sarah. Just to mention that um, our colleague Bob Watson, who usually looks after the uh, production and outputs of our labour market statistics, sends his apologies. So he would have been here otherwise today as well. Um, so apologies um, for, for the delay. So um, what I would like to cover in this presentation today together with Petia is to give you a bit of a brief overview of um, survey updates in terms of what's happened over the last year on the survey and uh, the impact that the uh, pandemic had on our response rate and sample bias. And then Petia is going to talk you through uh, sort of the methodology around the weight adjustments we applied to reduce the bias. And very briefly, um, I'll then also talk about what's ahead of us um, this year, what we will be looking into. Um, so at the last conference, which I believe was uh, end of 2020, I already gave um, a bit more of a detailed overview in terms of um, our response to the pandemic, in terms of how we changed the survey or adapted the survey um, uh, to continue to collect uh, obviously the labor force survey data. Um, so just briefly wanted to recap and add to that. Uh, so basically when our response rates started to drop in March 2020, um, obviously because um, respondents were more aware of, of the pandemic and, and um, interviewers could then not go out doing face-to-face -face interviews when lockdown started, then um, we, we had to make several adaptions to the, to the survey, to the data collection uh, strategy. Um, and in order to maintain our achieved sample, we then topped up the wave one um, sample for the LFS in July, 2020. Um, to maintain it at sort of the pre-pandemic level. But uh, because we were only doing telephone interviewing and we we're sampling from the postcode address file, we obviously had to obtain phone contact details for uh, our sample addresses. And we did that through uh, various different ways. Previously, we telematched uh, only addresses that uh, located north of the Caledonian Canal uh, for telephone interviewing. So we extended that to the entire sample. That only gave us about six to seven percent um, uh, phone contact details for uh, about six to seven percent of cases. So we then adapted our uh, advanced material as well and um, implemented an online portal asking residents of uh, sampled addresses to, pro to provide us with phone contact details through the portal. And then interviews could follow up with telephone interviews. Um, we also got phone uh, contact details through um, people contacting our survey inquiry line or by contacting our interviews directly, gave us uh, another six to seven percent. Um, but the, the biggest uh, part of phone contact details we actually obtained uh, through a sort of field tactic that we refer to as knock to nudge. We gained through uh, about 55 to 60 percent of phone contact details for our cases. So I wanted to explain a little bit more what knock to nudge is. So we introduced this in April 2021 after testing it on a couple of our other household surveys, which showed to be quite successful in, um, in increasing our response rate. And uh, as part of knock to nudge, uh, we basically um, uh, sent interviews or face-to-face -face interviews to cases where we weren't able to obtain any phone contact details and interviews will then make up to three call attempts to obtain a phone number at the doorstep and then follow that up with a telephone interview if successful. And we started uh, not to nudge only on wave one cases to start with, um, but then extended that to wave two 
plus cases as well, where um, these were sort of in the area uh, of wave one cases or where we weren't able to make a successful contact because the phone contact data were perhaps wrong or they were supplied late in the last wave. And um, not to match, I, I wanted to show you on the next few slides what uh, what um, success we had with using Noctonetch. Um, so here's the slide that shows the response rates over time in 2019, 2020. So you can see that before the pandemic, we had a sort of fairly healthy response rate in the mid 50s that obviously then drastically dropped with the start of the pandemic to the mid 20s and stayed around that level until we introduced Noctonetch in April 21. Um, which so we achieved around a 10 percentage point increase at the time and that leveled then around the late 30s over the summer. You can see a bit of a dip towards the end of last year, but that was not down to Noctonetch losing its effectiveness. That was down to Omicron um, really playing a part here. Uh, obviously, interviewers uh, couldn't go out um, due to uh, isolation rules. Um, and um, the capacity was stretched for that reason. So that's why we're seeing a bit of a dip there again. Um, but in general, obviously, Noctonetch did help bringing our response rate up a bit. Obviously, not back up to where it was before, as we didn't do it to, to the whole sample, just to a part of the sample where we, we didn't have any phone contact details or where, where we failed to make contact. Um, what impact did it have on our achieved samples? So um, um, pre-pandemic, you can see here the sample size um, for um, the LFS wave one, again, dropping drastically in March 20. And as I said earlier, we, we then um, uh, tweaked our sample or doubled it actually with uh, July 2020. And that meant that we actually then had a sample size that was a bit bigger than uh, before the pandemic. So we tweaked it a bit towards the end of the year um, uh, to, to bring it down to about the same level. And Noctonetch really helped us to maintain that so far, which was great. Now, um, that sort of showed us at the moment the quantitative impact that Noctonetch had. I also wanted to show you um, a few slides now with the, the qualitative impact that it had. Um, so uh, on this slide here, um, it shows the distribution of tenure, which is normally something where you don't see a lot of movement um, over time. Um, so the left bars on the side basically show the distribution of tenure before the pandemic. And uh, the green middle bar shows what the distribution of tenor was as we switched to telephone mode only. And we can see here that we got more owner occupiers and fewer renters in the sample in wave one. And when we then introduced Noctonetch to the mix, um, this is the purple bar in the middle, we can see that we are getting more of the harder to reach um, sample members back into the sample, so more renters and fewer of the owner occupiers. And when we look exclusive, exclusively at those cases that were subject to Noctonetch, which is the right dark green bar, we can see that the proportion is pretty close to the pre-pandemic level. Um, similar similar um, movement can be observed with individual characteristics such as age, which shows that we got more older and fewer younger uh, people in the sample um, as we switched to telephone mode. And again, Noctonetch helped us bring that back into the right direction. Um, similarly, NSEC, we had uh, more higher skilled and, and um, fewer routine um, workers in the sample. And again, Noctonetch helped to um, bring, uh, bring that back to the previous level. Material status, a similar picture, fewer single, more married uh, respondents. And uh, nationality, um, which we had a big debate over as well. We can see that we had more UK and fewer non-UK um, respondents in the sample. And um, the um, movement that we observed in tenure, as well as the one uh, with nationality and country of birth, uh, both of these led to some um, adjustment in the weighting. And um, this is what I hope I can hand over now to Petya to talk us through 
um, the adjustments that we made to our sample. So just checking now with the pets here, can use her audio successfully. I'm not sure which one is. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Pets. Yes. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yes, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Everything else with audio. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I'll go over to the next slide then and over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go over the methodology adjustments that we introduced. Uh, following the changes in the data collection and the pandemic that introduced quite a few biases into surveys as well. So the first thing we did was to add a non-response adjustment. Prior to the change in data collection, the LFS did not have a non-response adjustment. So what we did now is to uh, adjust the design weight of the household that joined after the change in the data collection. So from week 10 of quarter one of 2020 onwards. We adjusted these design ways by calculating probabilities of responding. We used logistic regressions to calculate these probabilities, and we used uh, GB region and aggregate level census factors of index of multiple deprivation, output areas, and urban ruler as cause areas to calculate these probabilities. Just to note, this was only done for GB, as Northern Island postcodes were not available last year, so we weren't able to link Northern Ireland to the census factors we needed as covariates. But now during the 2022 reweighting, which we're going to be starting uh, recent, just recently, we will include Northern Ireland as well. So this was the first thing that we looked at. Next slide, please. The other thing we wanted to see if there's any variables that we can actually use to help us mitigate the biases introduced in the form in the long term. And tenure particularly was key here because while other factors around labor market or migration or health awareness will eventually cause significant change over time in LFS outputs, the proportions of the housing stock that are rental or owner occupied are far more stable historically. As you can see on the screen, the distribution for tenure from 2018, the beginning of 2018, up to the end of 2019 is fairly stable. Because it's relatively constant, i.e. it's relatively predictable for us, this is a suitable variable to be used in mitigating action in the short term and the medium term as well that was introduced and that introduced biases into the sample. Um, indeed, we noticed differences in uh, proportions uh, responding to the sample with other characteristics as well, such as ethnicity, disability status, um, nationality, country of birth. So it wasn't just tenure. But we focused on tenure because it was so significantly affected by the change in collection and the pandemic, and because as a variable, it is far less susceptible to large changes compared to some of the other variables we collect. Furthermore, the distribution of other variables of concern are actually correlated with tenure. So it, uh, if we address tenure, we are also impacting other uh, outputs as well. So what we did is to use the average LFS tenure distribution across the four quarters of 2019 as a basis for weighting in addition to our prior already existing calibration band. We started doing this from JM20 onwards. The general effect of the introduction of the, uh, of the, introduction of the tenure weight is that those characteristics that are more present in owned outright housing will be reduced in the weighted estimates while those characteristics more prevalent in rented housing will increase. And this will affect not just personal characteristics, but also employment status and type of employment as well. Uh, just to note that we are aware of the caveat that the weights come from the 2019 survey, and without an external source to update them, they're not really suitable for use in the long term. But in the short, in the short term, they did have a good impact. Uh, next slide, please. So the impact of the 10-year waves uh, was as expected. So once we introduced them, we could see that the, unadjust, the adjusted unemployment rate um, got higher and the adjusted employment rate got lower, as we expected. Now, what we also noticed as well is that the introduction of the 10-year wave brought other characteristics closer to the long-term trends, such as the number of people born in the UK, number of people meeting definition of disability, etc. So the estimates produced across a range of variables after we introduced the 10-year weight 
uh, became more consistent and credible with other external information and long-term expected trends as well. However, we wanted to see if there's anything further we can do. Next slide, please. We noticed that country of birth is a particular concern as well. So the attrition rates decreased in the UK born after the pandemic, but they increased in non-UK born. And we observed this across all age bands that we used. The EU born started dropping out of the sample more than the EU non-EU born as well. Luckily for us, there was actually an admin source that we could use to try to mitigate this. Next slide, please. So we identified the RTI um, administrative source. This is real-time information. It comes from the HMRC, and RTI is the complete coverage of payroll employees, including by nationality. So this was a good opportunity for us to have an admin source that we can compare to the RTI data and see if first we can actually identify the bias and then if we can mitigate it. So LFS-based growth rates for year-on-year -year percentage changes for non-UK, it decreased much more between October, December 2019 and July, September 2020 compared to the RTI-based growth rate. So this showed us that the LFS estimates suffer from bias stemming from differential non-response between UK and non-UK born, and the additional tenure constraint that we included hasn't really reduced this bias sufficiently. Next step, please. So what we wanted to do is to find a way to use the RTA data to estimate year-on-year uh, -year population growth rates for EU and non-EU-born subpopulations, and we needed to get that for each rolling quarter in 2020 onwards. There were very few observations from the RTI data set, and it wasn't really suitable to fit a statistical model based on these few observations. So we had to use very simple assumptions to derive an expression of change in the population growth rates in terms of the change in RTI-based employee growth rates. So we wanted to see if we can track the RTI-based employee growth rates and see whether this is going to translate to population growth rate changes. In order for us to actually validate the estimator and validate and prove the assumptions that we made, we need to choose base periods as well. So we looked at October, December 2019 because this is the last period before the pandemic where the population growth is known. The assumptions we made were that any change in the population growth rate of the non-UK subpopulation is going to be in the same direction as the change in their RTI employee growth rate. So we wouldn't expect RTI employee growth rates for non-UK born to be increasing, while the population growth rate of the non-UK born is decreasing. We also expected that the magnitude of change in the population growth rate does not exceed that of change in the RTI employee growth rate, because the RTI is only of the employees, whereas the population will include employees, self-employed, unemployed, et cetera. So we wouldn't expect the magnitude to actually be um, disproportionate. So given these assumptions, next slide, please. We selected a very um, kind of quick method, which is three steps and we essentially wanted to check if we can um, estimate the population growth rate based on the RTI growth rate. So let, if we let Tita denote the RTI employee growth rate of the EU-born population between JS20, so July, September 20, and JS19, we also adjusted RTI year-on-year -year percentage changes in any subpopulation by differentiating the UK national. So in the equations, if we take theta RTI for JS20 for EU, for example, the adjusted version of that is the theta RTI employee total growth rate for JS20 for EU minus the theta RTI employee growth rate for the UK. We removed the UK because we wanted to account for background change in employment in the country. So if we let Y denote the population growth rate of the EU-born population, we would actually assume that the population growth rate for EU born since the pandemic, so YJS20 EU adjusted, uh, is going to be proportional to the growth rate in the RTI. So the population growth rate, the last equation on the slide, the population growth rate for JS20 for EU born adjusted, minus that from the base period, which is OD19 for the EU, will be proportionate to the, pop, to the RTI employee growth rate 
for the same period minus that base period. So essentially, we are looking at um, proportionally estimating this. And we did, uh, we have published on our on a website proof of this estimation method. And we did show that the change of the population growth rate between a base period and a period from 2020 is approximately proportional to the change in RTI employee growth rate. We also choose a proportionality factor, so B, to be set to 0.5, because this will be a positive number, but we set it to 0.5 to minimize mean prediction errors. Now, after we've decided on the method and after we did the proof of it, we wanted to compare it to external sources. Next slide, please. So we first looked at LTIM. So this is the long-term international migration estimate. All the numbers that you see on the slide are presented in the thousands. So we compared the method and estimates to the LTIM, and this is year-on-year -year changes. We noticed that the year-on-year -year changes between uh, RTI-based estimates and the LTIM are actually fairly close. Uh, and the mean percentage deviation for the estimates um, that we produced on the adjusted RTI growth rate is very close to zero, and the mean deviation itself is only two. So this gave us the confidence that the developed estimator is actually approximately unbiased. The bottom table shows the year-on-year -year change, sorry, year-on-year -year change in the population totals of the UK-born and non-UK-born subpopulation, and of the whole population using RTI and then only the LFS without the RTI adjustment. We can see that in the first quarter, there is very little evidence, a very little difference between the, uh, the, between the, the two. However, that difference increases with time. The differences between the estimates by country of birth, however, are much larger, and they also increase over time. So it is clear that the unadjusted LFS responses underrepresent non-UK born. So in order for us to fix this, the, the introduction of the RTI-based estimates did bring our estimates closer to other external sources, and it fixed that underrepresentativeness that was present in the data, at least to an extent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to follow up with just um, a few notes on oh, what's ahead of us now in, in 2020. Um, so I explained earlier about our field strategy and obviously we're still um, exclusively telephone interviewing on the LFS. The ONS has started some face-to-face -face trials end of last year on a small scale, looking at the practicalities around that, going into people's houses again. And um, the first findings were quite uh, promising. So a further more large scale a trial is planned um, in spring this year. Um, although that won't be done on the LFS, so it will be done on some of our other surveys. And um, we then will consider the output the outcomes of that before uh, this might be rolled out on the labour force survey. Petia briefly mentioned earlier about um, a re-weighting um, over the course of 2022. So obviously we completed the re-weighting exercise based on the RTI data over the course of last year, and we're planning an update to that um, based on the same methodology over the course of this year on, on uh, using the latest uh, RTI data. And as further sources of, uh, for estimates of the population become available, then from the census uh, later this year, um, we'll, we'll review the methodology further um, and um, further rebating uh, may take place um, possibly next year, but plans around that haven't really taken shape yet. So there's still a lot of debate over that. And um, with that, we at the end of our presentation. Apologies again for the uh, technical hiccups we experienced, but um, hopefully um, you were all able to to follow the content, regardless. Fantastic, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I think we shall move on then to the the next talk. Um, great. So this is um, the transformation of labour market statistics um, with James Harris. Okay, and James joined the ONS working for a few years in population statistics on both estimates and projections before moving on to work with local authorities across the country on all types of sub subnational statistics, including businesses, trade, jobs, wages, health and demographics for almost a decade. 
He is now leading the Labour Force Survey team as they work through the transformation to new methods of collecting labour market data. And this is what he's going to be updating us on today. Okay, over to you then, James. Um, Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. There we are, I'm on, hooray. Right. Well, hello, everybody. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, glad to see so many people here. So my name's James Harris. I was previously working in subnational statistics, now head of the Labour Force Survey. Uh, just uh, letting you know a couple of my colleagues on the line as well. So obviously, you've, you've heard from Martina, who's in charge of the uh, LFS production. Uh, you also have my colleagues, uh, Jason Zawadzki. So he's the divisional director of, of our di whole division now. So uh, my manager, uh, formerly in charge of the census 2021 operations. So uh, very, very aware of what's necessary for the, the operations of, of running surveys and data collection. Uh, and uh, that's now, of course, uh, slowly tying up. And he's now moved across to work with us in terms of the transformation of labor market statistics. And also uh, Orla Fraser on the line. Uh, who's uh, in charge of uh, parts parts of the transformation? So looking after the, the labour market statistics uh, transformation aspects, in particular, looking at the the quality and the, the design aspects of everything. So what I'm going to talk about today is the transformation of labour market statistics. Uh, but more importantly, this is what I'm going to cover. So our vision for the transformation. So what we're going to be delivering. So what what you you can expect to see, and then touching on what to expect to come next. So first off, our, our vision for transforming the labor market statistics, where we're going, what we're doing, why we're doing it. So there's been a very long history of labor market statistics, as I'm sure most of you do know. We've been running the labor force survey for almost 50 years. Uh, te technically, we're heading into our 50th year, I think now. Uh, we're producing uh, regular cross-sectional labor market statistics and estimates. So this has been in production for a very long time. And you've already heard from, from uh, Martina, the, the developments that we're, we're uh, undertaking to make sure that this continues, that we're able to continue producing these numbers. But more importantly than that, perhaps enabling a wide variety of articles and analysis of workers and their characteristics and circumstances. So internally within ONS, producing outputs and analysis and breakdowns, I think an awful lot of activity, of course, to the current pandemic we've been producing over the last few months, uh, our colleagues all across the rest of government, so DWP, DFE, looking at aspects of the labour market, monitoring the developments and so forth. And perhaps more importantly, all of you on the line, all of the use of the data or of the information of the uh, available uh, resources that we have to produce your own articles, your own analysis, like we had the presentation from Nye earlier on, looking at the breakdowns of the labour market, of, about the population, about the different aspects of society going on at the moment. And of course, speaking of society, we're trying to evolve to uh, over time to the developing changing needs and the shape of society. So adding questions, subtracting questions when things become important. Uh, so, you know, uh, over the course of time, the last few years, we've had Brexit on the on the horizon. Now we've had the COVID pandemic. Us. We've had an awful lot of changes, the new industrial classifications, new occupational classifications, just to example. So making sure that we're keeping updated and following what's happening over the course of time. Um, but through that, through all our engagements, through conversations with, with you, with everybody, with co colleagues internally, recognising all the various questions, suggestions, issues and issues that not only our colleagues, but you, the users, have been raising over the years through the different formats, through the different forums that we have, the uh, communities and local information partnerships uh, groups and all the different uh, outreach programs that we have. So an awful lot of information that you want, you want faster and more frequent outputs. Ideally, you want monthly estimates or indeed the RTI information theoretically it's real time but we'll see what we can do uh, but ideally with monthly as, a, as a, a core target right now having more robust and more detailed data on the character particularly on characteristics of interest so you know the personal characteristics of who the people and who the workers are and what what, what their uh, social is having uh, being able to be more flexible being able to faster to respond to the changing needs of the day so what are the new policies on the horizon what are the new changes that are happening what what uh, information do we need about the changing labor market on a you know day-to-day -day basis and what's changing over the course of time a uh, big of course aspect in terms of high quality data quality takes uh, all sorts of different aspects that we will touch on more in a moment but just fundamentally higher quality uh, better uh, confidence intervals so that you're more certain more sure of what what we're actually uh, producing 
Uh, of course, you also want it easier for the public to take part, so in part to improve the response rates, to reduce the respondent burden, but fundamentally so that the users, the, the respondents to the survey actually are, are able to participate, they're able to understand the questions, they're able to respond more easily, more quickly, uh, and, and then uh, um, uh, feedback their, their thoughts on, on what the current situation is. And the, the uh, resilience of what we're doing, so making sure that what we're doing is sustainable and resilient, so we're able to continue the production, we're able to continue the collection, we're able to do what needs to be done to produce and, and publish the data, especially during times of uncertainty like COVID. So Martin has already been through a couple of the approaches that we've had to introduce to make sure that the collection is, is robust and uh, working effectively. And of course, we're trying to develop and change things to make sure that that's uh, consistent in future as well. So what's our, our broad vision? So the transformation, fundamentally, we're looking at delivering statistics for the public good. That's the vision for the whole, the whole department. But we're looking in particular at integrating surveys, sensors, and administrative data as the broad aim right at the top. But beneath that, in terms of specifically labor market statistics, we're looking at producing more coherent, more granular, more timely statistics, in particular being responsive to the user needs. So what the what variables people need, what information people need, what we need to be monitoring in terms of the labor market. And of course, trying to reduce the costs and the burden, both for government, for businesses and households and make it easier to respond to. Now, I mentioned in here, of course, trying to add a, more sources as well so trying to add administrative data trying to add new uh, linked information so that we understand people and, and the society even better it's a complicated process trying to link up all the different administrative sources you know the hmrc uh, paye data the um, uh, real-time information information uh, the uh, health records and all these different things trying to look at what what situation people are in trying to make sure that we have as much information as we possibly can from all these different records but uh, of course, that, that comes over the course of time with an awful lot of research. Here we're, we're making sure that this is an online first responsive design. So we're trying to transform the surveys to make them more effective, more responsive, so that fundamentally we can improve the quality of them. So trying to gather a larger overall sample size uh, with you know, more robust processing systems so that we're able to produce the information faster and more effectively trying to build the modular design to integrate more question blocks. So, you know, when users come along, when uh, colleagues in the government come along wanting to know more information, different information, new questions, new, uh, new uh, policies on the horizon, new topics of interest, trying to build things effectively so that we're able to add in new modules, add in more questions in a, a simpler manner and a faster manner as well. And being therefore being more flexible and more able to respond to the fast changes that people actually need in particular the, the speed aspect to it so that we you know it doesn't take massively long to add new questions that we're able to discuss and negotiate and figure out where, what's necessary from a, a, a question point of view and trying to add that in in a matter of uh, months or weeks rather than years that this can sometimes happen and of course Things have been changing over the last few years. I mentioned the industrial and occupational classifications as two basic examples, but making sure that we are updating and upgrading the questions and the response categories that people have so that you know, uh, so that we're, we're up to date, we're current, we know what the current situation is with the, the society and the population. We're using the correct definitions, we're using the harmonized classifications wherever possible, changes with things like the census so that we're, we're uh, consistent with other sources as well. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of the slide here in particular, looking at the improved ability to monitor progress. So making sure that the collection is effective and appropriate and the, the uh, things like the knock to nudge processes are effective and working and moving uh, responses in the right direction. And it's all building into our longer term aim, the thing called IPAX, or perhaps it's an internal term, but the Integrated Population and Characteristics Survey, fundamentally trying to build all these sources together into one coherent source of information that we can understand the whole population and society. So trying to build a stable core system all on this, this common capability so that all these sources are built in similar fashion, that we can link the information together more easily, that they're capturing all the relevant uh, variables that need to be that uh, we're, we're meeting the survey needs, not just your current needs, not just what, what we're currently producing, but also looking at future needs, you know, the, the government's levelling up agenda, for example, on, on, uh, on the cards right now, 
trying to collect make sure that we have the information that we need not just now but trying to plan for the next six months a year 10 years if necessary but that that's the kind of the the future aspects of what we're going hopefully to be delivering over the coming year few years but specifically what we're working on right now in terms of this particular transformation so moving from the vision to the actual delivery so we're going to be obviously continuously producing the labor market data, continu continuously delivering it. We've been producing this information for, as I said, some decades already, but making sure that we're continuing the production as, as, as normal, uh, trying to uh, provide similar data sets that you're all currently receiving. So it may not be exactly the same. It might be a slightly different format. So CSE rather than SPSS, for example, there may be slight differences in the variable names, slight differences in the content that you're getting, hopefully, uh, when I say differences in sample size, hopefully a larger sample size. So a larger sample size, hopefully leading to a larger number of responses, meaning that you're able to do more granular granular analysis, larger, larger proportions of people in each category that you're then able to draw better conclusions from. Uh, and of course, you'll still be getting your, your person, your household and your longitudinal views. So all of that continues to be produced and it's a, a, a part of the transformation designs. Um, we have, of course, refreshed and updated the content of variables for the latest definitions. So uh, making sure that we have the, the correct, you know, ethnic categories that match up with the census, the correct religious categories, the correct uh, response categories to the industrial and occupational classifications and everything else, trying to, you know, give robust and detailed information about people's character, uh, personal characteristics. And of course, some things will have changed. So, you know, age and sex and uh, ethnicity will not have changed radically over the course of time. But some variables will have, uh, you know, come and gone and, and uh, updated over the course of time. So we'll, we're, we're reviewing the effectiveness of all of them and making sure that we're asking the right questions to get the right answers. Um, and of course, fundamentally this is all leading towards having higher quality data so not just the sample size but making sure that we have higher quality data uh, so we have three core targets that we're aiming for i know all is on the line if i say anything wrong here please do correct me but fundamentally trying to uh, reduce the bias so achieving a representative sample that we make sure that we're capturing the whole of the population in the right way, that we're, we're uh, represent, representing all the different categories and groups of, of people, uh, min, uh, focusing on both national and local improvements. So trying to minimize the variability between different regions, between different uh, indices of multiple deprivation categories, between different output area classification categories, to make sure that we're, we're not uh, mistargeting anything in, uh, disproportionately. And as I say, trying to make sure that we have proportional samples by all the different personal characteristics, so age, sex, disability, tenure, ethnicity, the key variables that we know everybody needs. Trying to reduce the attrition as well, so making sure that it's not just wave one responses that we're getting, but that once you're in the survey, hopefully we're continuing to get your, your continued engagement through wave one to two to three up to all the way up to five. So hoping to reduce the drop off in response rates between waves, trying to ensure that we have a sufficient sample size by the time we get to wave five and whether or not we get the sufficient sample size, trying to make sure that there's no bias in the changes to the sample, that it's still the same age, sex, disability groups, and so forth, that we're representing the population appropriately through the process. And of course, hopefully try to improve the response rate throughout the whole process. So reducing the operational complexity, reducing the respondent burden, such that we're still able to meet all these quality targets, that we're able to increase the response rates and hopefully uh, not introduce any new biases. And of course, over the course of time, building the capability, not just now, but for the future. So I've touched on what we're, we're building right now, so that we're building you know, a transformed system, building a, a better survey, better way of sampling and so forth. And over the course of time, we're aiming to add more functionality to the survey. So hopefully, uh, as I said earlier, faster response to emerging needs that we're able to uh, capture new questions and uh, new topics of concern as they come up and in engagement with users such as yourselves, uh, trying to add the functionality for additional modules, making trying to make things more frequent. So we may not necessarily be delivering that in the coming few months or year or so, but adding the capability that we will be able to add modules and add more frequent data and trying 
trying to better integrate things into different production systems. I won't give you all the acronyms, but we have a bunch of different production systems within ONS and across government. And I'm sure some of you have your own production systems that use the LFS data as well. So trying to make things uh, more, more effective, more, more uh, tech friendly as well. And working with our, our publishing colleagues, so the, the web dissemination side, especially trying to build more exciting ways of, of viewing and interacting with the data, new uh, means of accessing the information, new means of presenting the information, new data visualizations, for example, new data science techniques, trying to look at the, the information in, in new and exciting ways. So over the course of time, trying to build these capabilities. Uh, I mentioned uh, in terms of the questions, so looking from a first principles approach so not just taking a question on at face value and just sticking it on the survey making sure that we're answering the right question that we're meeting the user need it's not just a definition of a variable it's actually meeting the what people need to know that we're asking the right question or multiple questions to get to that final uh, requirement at the end and in engaging in an awful lot of cognitive testing with respondents with people answering the survey to make sure that we're getting the responses that we expect that they understand it that it's uh, received in the right way that it's all understood and we have extensive systems and flow testing to make sure that the uh, questionnaire is designed in the right way that the questions are asked in the right order that uh, the routing is correct and that we're uh, getting the right responses that we're expecting and that people aren't randomly missing questions or skipping questions or whatever so making sure that we have all these extensive systems and testing all in place and wherever possible trying to maintain consistency with uh, you know, ONS standards, with GDS standards, with uh, Office for Stats Regulation standards, with standards set, for, uh, for example, with the Equalities Office, all the different uh, international standards as well in terms of industrial and occupational classifications. So wherever possible, trying to remain consistent with all the different standards that are available, and indeed, hopefully with the time series. So you, you don't see a, a much radical change over the course of all the different time series in terms of the data sets that we produce. Uh, just one touching briefly on, on the data collection flow, because this is one uh, change that, that's uh, rather significant. So currently, or <laughs> this has changed a little over the course of the pandemic, but the, currently the process is that we issue the survey to the respondents and either they, they, uh, they respond face to face or they respond by telephone. Obviously over the course of the pandemic, that's slightly changed. So this is a very simplified model here, but fundamentally, Somebody turns up at the door, knocks the door, you know, uh, hi, we're from the ONS, we'd like you to engage in this survey. And before the pandemic and hopefully after the pandemic, either we have a little face-to-face -face interview there uh, with the person so that we get all the information as accurate as possible, or as it has been over the last few months, engaging in the telephone capture. So making sure that they're able to answer the telephone, uh, the survey by the telephone, making sure that they have all the information that they need, making sure that, uh, uh, you know, encouraging them to, to engage with the process. And then once we've got that, that telephone capture, uh, we either have a response or a refusal or, or a failure out at the end of it, but uh, trying to actively promote uh, engagement with the survey and with the collection. Uh, over, over the course of time, it was normally with the LFS, it used to be face to face first in wave one and then following up by telephone. But over now we're going for an online first approach. So again, issuing the survey, hoping that people respond online, hoping that we get the right uh, um, responses. But if they're not responding online, going through the process of telephone capture, whether it's the, the telematching that Martina mentioned or whether it's uh, a knock to nudge process to find people's telephone numbers. Maybe it's uh, they responded in wave one and then we're, we're phoning them up for wave two just to make sure that they, they understood and they're able to uh, respond but some sort of process here trying to get an online response or a telephone response possibly not uh, with a knock to nudge process trying to encourage that and in the course of time hopefully we're aiming to add uh, active field interviews into the process uh, as the, the final option available to uh, re respondents if they wanted to fundamentally trying to get a response out of users so essentially the same process but if I just skip back previously there wasn't an online option it was just a face first and then telephone first, but now it's online first, telephone second and field third. So that's what we're hoping to deliver, but what to expect next, what's coming. So obviously we're delivering the, this transformation. So we're going to make iterative improvements over the course of the year. So we have an online mode that's already live. We're adding telephone mode coming up very soon. So in the next month or so, hopefully adding the telephone mode into the process then adding more additional questions, 
then adding a field mode in later 2022. Whether that's just not NUD or an active field mode, we're still working through the exact details, but that, that's what's happening over the course of this year. And of course, throughout that, but fundamentally aiming at a, an upgraded production system that we're able to produce these statistics robustly and quickly and accurately uh, and, and building with the, the new uh, design that we have uh, coming forward. And of course, it doesn't end there, this ongoing upgrade. So it's not just that we're, we're producing this thing now, we're going to have to make sure that the systems are still working, the questions are updated and upgraded and uh, make sure that everything's functioning appropriately. And of course, actively monitoring the progress and effectiveness of this over time. So looking at the response rates, looking at the quality of the information coming forward. So we'll be dual running uh, both the, the, the new design and the, the current LFS collection, dual running those over the course of a good number of months. They're, they're both live concurrently at the same time so that we're able to uh, compare the two sources and make sure that they're, they're delivering what we expect them to deliver and continuing the engagement with the regulatory bodies. So for the Office for Stats Regulation, so making sure that we're still complying with all the requirements, all the needs, all the, the badging uh, necessities to make sure that we're uh, collecting the right information in the right way, that it can be uh, still uh, retain the, the badge if possible. And of course, we have the intention to release the indicative results in late 2022. So hopefully later this year, you should see some initial results from this newly transformed system so that we uh, understand uh, what what the, the labor market looks like and, and that the systems are all functioning as we expect them to. And the target is that all of this, so the online mode, telephone mode, field mode, everything is all in place come autumn 2023. So all these improvements will hopefully be uh, in train, in, in action, working by uh, uh, autumn next year. And what's happened to the LFS during this time, you might ask? Well, nothing radically is changing. So we're continuing production of the LFS data until at least mid-2023. You know, all the production, all the collection is still continuing as normal. No substantive changes to the content or design. So all the variables in, in the LFS, they're all staying there. We're not adding or subtracting anything in particular. Uh, no big changes to that. The um, collection, you know, the knock to nudge process or the exact sample size might change a little bit as, as Martina mentioned, but that's uh, for the purposes of making sure that we're collecting what we need to collect. Uh, continuing to maintain all the materials. So the user guidance and the data sets all being produced and published and updated uh, as they normally are on a regular basis. And of course, continuing the, our, our customer contact services. If any of you have dealt with the, the Dart team, for example, making sure that we're still uh, maintaining the, the, the uh, continued access through that process and uh, archiving the, the current data and so making sure it's in the current system so that the ways of accessing the data in the, the data archive and other places that you're still able to retain the access for future analysis. And of course, we're all taking this journey together. It's, it, this, it's nice talking about the transformation, but you're a part of this as well. So making sure that we're continuing to engage with, with all of you, all of our users or, and, and the producers as well, continuing the engagement events, including our, our, our labor market uh, working groups. Uh, there'll be a feedback exercise in the spring regards to how, how the transformation is going. We'll be publishing blogs and updates, and I mentioned the experimental results coming hopefully later this year. So you should be getting, uh, I can't say regular, but uh, um, regular implies it'll be on a monthly basis. We'll, you'll be getting updates as and when we have uh, information to, to disseminate. And of course, engaging in, in conference events like this, for example, but giving updates and, and developments as they come along uh, when, when there are uh, conferences to attend. And making sure that over the course of time, you have sufficient guidance and materials and information. So all the user guidance, all the documentation, uh, snippets of code, if, if we have them available, making sure that you have all the information you need about the transformation and about what's coming, that, that you're able to uh, take this on board. And uh, remember, we're, we're further developing the 50 year legacy. So we have a long history of good quality, good, good uh, labor market statistics all there in the public domain for the for the public good. And we're making sure that we're developing this, improving this, uh, making sure that you have the information you need and, and trying to bring it all up to date with the modern technologies and modern descriptions and definitions. Uh, just on the final slide here, so, you know, making sure that you're part of the engagement. So if you have questions, if you have issues, if you have uh, things, things that you want to know more about, if you want to be uh, kept in touch with through the process, uh, the, the email address here, social surveys at ons.gov.uk. So do get in touch if there's something that you want to know or something that you want to follow up on. Uh, and I, I'd welcome any, any additional questions. So uh, I see 
number five in the Q&A section. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, head towards questions. Thank you very much.